Hello, I'm Moises Naim, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Hay Festival, this time from uh, Peru, and from Peru to the rest of the world, Arequipa, Peru to the world. And I have the immense pleasure of welcoming Yuval Noah Harari. This is another opportunity we have to uh, talk about te themes of common interest, and delighted to have you with us, uh, Yuval. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You need no introduction. Uh, you uh, let me just say you have a PhD. You are a historian. Uh, you have a PhD from Oxford University. You teach at the Department of History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. But that doesn't tell the whole story. The whole story is that you are the closest that the academic community, the historians have to a rock star, <laughs> to a person with global fame. Uh, and the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, 27 million books uh, uh, you have sold. Only of Sapiens, uh, which is the book we're gonna be discussing today, uh, mm. seven, 16 million uh, copies have been sold in 60 languages. And it's not just the numbers, it's also the, the, the support, the endorsement. Bill Gates uh, says that Sapiens is a fun, engaging look at early human history. You'll have a hard time putting it down. President Barack Obama, interesting and provocative. It gives you a sense of perspective on how briefly we have been on this earth, how short uh, things like agriculture and science have been around and why it makes sense for us to not to take them for granted. So um, all around there is acclaim, admiration, uh, and uh, you surely have created a, a spark new interest in, in things that happened 70,000 years ago. Uh, <laughs> and um, you, you have, all your books are best-selling books, uh, Sapiens, but you have also Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, uh, 21 Lessons uh, for the 21st Century, and now you have a graphic uh, uh, version mm of, uh, uh, of uh, Sapiens, which is this uh, uh, version in, in graphics, is, is a comic book. Yeah, it's a comic book. A and, uh, it's a brilliant idea to reach an audience that you would not otherwise reach. This, I mm. hope, it's having the success it deserves. Um, and, but so the first question is, you have now had the, the experience of uh, disseminating your ideas through different platforms, from classrooms in universities to uh, social media, to TED Talks, uh, to conferences, to books, uh, and now graphic books. Hmm. Which one do you feel has had the most impact? Well, I, I suppose the book has the most impact, I mean, uh, Sapiens, but... Um, if the idea is to reach a, a wide audience and, and different people from different walks of life, then you need a combination of different mediums. There is no reason to focus on just one. And this is not something new. Throughout history, uh, people used all kinds of media in order to tell their story, to tell the story of the past of humankind. So, you know, like telling history in images is something that you find in medieval Europe, like if you think about the bio tapestry that depicts the Norman invasion of England, or if you think about the uh, Aztec and Maya images depicting the Spanish invasion. So it has a long history. And I think that the main point is to be able to speak to different people in different ways um, that make the story more engaging, more fun, at least also for me as a writer, I think the graphic novel was the most fun project I ever worked on. It was like exploring and experimenting with different ways of telling history, kind of leaving aside all the academic conventions of how you write history and trying something completely different. And I understand you are a, a character in, in, the, in the graphic novel. You are in, in the comic book, yeah. you, you, you appear. And, and, and originally, in, initially, you were a bit reluctant. And I can understand why an academic and a historian would mm. be reluctant to be a character in a comic book. But yeah. then you relented. What happened? Who twisted your arm and forced you to do this? Uh, well, I, I mean, the graphic novel is not my creation alone. It's a collaborative effort with David and Danielle. They are the artists. That, that they understand the medium of graphic novels much better than me. And they said, we need you in the book as a character to serve as a kind of guide to the readers, explaining different scientific ideas. And I resisted this of, uh, at, at first. You know, in, in the original book, I don't appear. 
I don't like this to put myself, it's not about me, it's about history, so why should I be there? So eventually we reached a compromise that, okay, I'll be there, but not alone. We will have a group of scientists representing different disciplines, and I will be just one among them. That was important, first of all, to convey the idea that science is never the work of a single person. Most of what I know about history comes from the work of other people. I, I never conducted an archeological excavation. I'm not an archeologist. I'm not a geneticist, so I can't analyze ancient DNA and, and so forth. So we have a group of like four or five scientists, different, some of them fictional, some of them real people like me. And this also enables um, to have a conversation and not a kind of one-sided lecture. So you can show that there are different opinions, that scientists sometimes disagree, that they kind of, of work together. And uh, this was a compromise that I, I could live with. I was skeptical at the beginning when I was reading this that it could capture the, 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 all the details and the nuances of the book. The book is overwhelming in terms of the scope of uh, uh, the, the, the story it tells and the number of variables and the surprises and all that. So I, I said, no, you know, it's going to be hard to, to, you know, to capture everything. Mm. But I have to say that it, it, you, you, you did, you and your colleagues uh, did achieve that. Well, and we, we didn't try to just, you know, it's, it's not like we take sapiens and just illustrate it. Um, it it uh, gave us the opportunity to explore new ways of thinking, new plots, so to present the material in a, in a fresh way. Uh, and for me to, to work also with fictional characters and fictional plot lines, like, I don't know, in the, in, we have a chapter about the history of inequality which is a very difficult and serious and, and, and tragic story really about human inequality and hierarchies and racism and so forth. And to convey it in an accessible way. So we created this fictional character of Detective Lopez. She is a police officer and she investigates crime. So she goes after the biggest crime in history, inequality, trying to understand who is behind it. Who, is the, who are the criminals? What's driving this? And this gave us the opportunity to, to, to uh, uh, talk about this very serious and difficult subject, but in a fresh and engaging way. Let me now turn to the substance of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the essence, again, you, you are very big on uh, the force of co collaboration and cooperation of yeah. human beings at, 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 at scale. Uh, as an explanation of the success of Homo sapiens uh, in, in, in prevailing as a the species, as the main species of, 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 uh, in, the, in the world, mm -hmm. and was able to outcompete and, uh, and make disappear the Neanderthals, for example, that were. Uh, but you ascribe uh, this capacity to coordinate to three revolutions the cognitive revolution, the agricultural revolution, and the scientific revolution. Yeah. You say that these have affected humans and their fellow or, or, uh, organisms and enhanced uh, hu the human's uh, ability to coordinate. Why don't yes. you tell us a little bit about the three revolutions and their coordinate, the impact on coordination mm. among, among humans? Well, you know, humans have existed for millions of years and for most of this time, we were quite insignificant apes. If you go back 100,000 years or 200,000 years, so the couple of million humans around the world from different species, not just Homo sapiens, also like you say, Neanderthals and others, and their impact on the world is quite small. And then something happens and our species drives to extinction all the other humans and takes over the world. And what happened? I mean, what is our superpower that enables us to do it? And the answer is, is that we are the only ape, we actually, we are the only mammal that can cooperate in very large numbers, especially with large numbers of strangers. You know, chimpanzees cooperate, Neanderthals cooperated, but only in small numbers, like 50 chimpanzees can cooperate because their cooperation is based on knowing each other. I know you, you know me, we can, we can hunt together. Humans cooperate with strangers, with millions of strangers. You know, like just to have this conversation with you, I don't know how many thousands of people 
are engaged in, in setting this up and we don't know them. And yeah, it, it enables us to cooperate. Or, you know, like this shirt I'm wearing, it was produced by some people thousands of kilometers from here that I never met them and they produced the shirt that I'm wearing. So this is our superpower. And underneath it, what enables us to cooperate with strangers, millions of strangers, is the ability to uh, invent fictional stories, spread them around. And as, as long as everybody believes in the same story, everybody can follow the same rules. So even strangers can cooperate. This and is most three... clear in the case of religion, uh, but it's also true of economics. You know, the people who produce this shirt did it because I pay them money. And money is probably the most successful story ever told. You know, it's, it's, it's a fiction. It has no value in itself. All these dollars and euros and pesos, they have no value. But you believe and I believe that these pieces of paper or electronic data on computer has value. We believe the stories that the bankers and finance ministers tell us. And this is why we can create a global trade network. So this was the first big revolution in cooperation, the ability to invent stories and thereby make strangers cooperate. Then we have agriculture, uh, during which humans have learned how to domesticate certain animals and, and plants, um, cows, goats, uh, rice, potatoes. And this gave them much more power, much more food, so they can create much bigger societies, cities and kingdoms and empires. And finally, we have the scientific revolution, which began like 500 years ago and is still going on, which gave us immense new powers. We basically decipher the laws of physics and chemistry and biology. And every time we decipher a new law of nature, we understand nature better, it gives us power. Like now with this pandemic, that uh, you know, there the, the have been pandemics for thousands of years, and for thousands of years, humans have been helpless because they didn't understand what's happening. Now we understand what a virus is, how it infects us, and how we can protect ourselves from the virus. And this too is based on cooperation. Uh, like the, 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 the research of viruses, like in the coronavirus epidemic, and the production of vaccines, it's done through the cooperation of thousands, tens of thousands of scientists all over the world. So you were talking about um, the, the success of the scientists uh, to mm. deal and, and come up with the vaccines very, very quickly mm -hmm. to respond uh, uh, to the pandemic and how this is an example of human collaboration at yeah. large scale. But we witnessed with great concern and anxiety how while the scientists delivered at speed and scale, the politicians became smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, they were protectionists, there were uh, the ability to coordinate uh, was not there. Yes. The level of coordination has been very, very, very low and slow. And you have uh, been very strident in your criticism of uh, governments and politicians in terms of how slowly and inadequately they have reacted. Uh, that, that, and, and that is an example of non-coordination yeah. <laughs> that uh, threatens the, the planet, right? Tell us about that. Exactly. I and mean, if you look at the last two years since the beginning of this crisis, so it's a scientific triumph coupled with political disaster. Because, you know, the scientific achievement has been amazing. It took just a few weeks to <laughs> identify the virus which is responsible for the epidemic. It took just about a year to mass produce not just one vaccine, but several vaccines. For the first time in history, we are not helpless in the face of pandemics. We actually have enough power to stop pandemics. But unfortunately, you know, the, the scientists, they produce the tools. This is their job. How to use the tools, this is no longer the job of scientists. This is the job of politicians. They need to make political decisions about how to use the tools. And this was a, a huge failure. You know, even now, we are like almost two years since the beginning of this crisis, and still there is no global plan of action how to overcome the pandemic and deal with its economic consequences. You let, know, me certain... confirm, let me confirm what you're saying. In today's, as we speak, the, the Financial Times uh, uh, 
very well respected and known newspaper has a story mm -hmm. that says the world is woefully unprepared for the next health crisis. And this yeah. comes from a report jointly sponsored made by the World Health Organization and the World Bank. And it says that uh, um, it, there is scant evidence that the right lessons were being learned from the coronavirus crisis, mm. despite the deaths of near, nearly 5 million people worldwide. So, and some people have said that the coronavirus is just the dress rehearsal for what's coming, that uh, for yeah. climate change, we will again have a, a planetary, a global threat that will require concerted action at a, at a, at a, at a planetary level. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, these threats very often in politics lead to isolationism, to uh, uh, protectionism, to build walls, to, mm -hmm. to keep others away. Is that a threat to the survival of uh, Homo sapiens? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the coronavirus pandemic, it can't destroy us. I even if we react, and we have reacted in, in, in not in an ideal way, and some governments have reacted in a disastrous way, like we've seen with the Bolsonaro regime in, in, in Brazil. Even then, it can't, it can't destroy human civilization. We are stronger than that. But there are other planetary threats, global threats, like you said, that are an existential threat to humankind. Climate change can destroy the basis for human civilization. A nuclear war can destroy humankind. The rise of new disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence, if it's not handled in, in the right way, in a wise way, it can destroy human civilization. And that's the big danger. If the politicians are unable to cooperate and come up with the plan in the face of a relatively uh, simpler threat like COVID, what chance do we have? of uniting in the face of a much more complicated threat like climate change or like the rise of, of AI. So this is what really frightens me when I look at, at, at the world uh, uh, right now. It seems like there are no adults in, in the room, that you know, everybody is just taking care of their country and their interests. And it should be obvious that you can't really protect yourself. Even if you care only about your country, you still need to cooperate with other countries. You know, if you vaccinate all the people in your country and you allow the virus to continue to spread in other countries, there will be mutations and maybe a new variant of the virus will overcome your vaccine and will be more deadly or more infectious. So forget about ethics, forget about morality. For your egoistic reasons, you need to provide good healthcare for people all around the world. You mentioned this obsession with building walls. But all over the world, you now see countries building walls on the border. We do need to build the wall, but not on the border between countries, on the border between humankind and the virus world. You can imagine it like two hostile countries that if a virus jumps over the border from a bat to a human being anywhere on the planet, it endangers all of us. So we need to build a wall that covers everybody. If you just take care of the people in your country and you forget to take care of the people in other countries, you are leaving the border between humankind and the virus world exposed to invasion. Uh, Sapiens uh, uh, was published in 2011, uh, mm -hmm. almost 10, 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, if you were going to write it again now, uh, <laughs> what would you take out? Was there a mistake somewhere? Was there an, a, a misinterpretation? Was there something mm. that you thought and you wrote in that book that was going to happen or was happening that turned out not to be right? So if you were writing again, mm -hmm. what would you include that is not in the original book? Well, actually, I am writing it again as the, as the graphic novel, so I have this chance. And um, the main plot is, is the same, the main idea as I was the same. There are a lot of different details, but, um, you know, when I wrote Sapiens, so one of the last chapters in Sapiens talks about the decline of violence in the last few decades. 
uh, the decline of war. And uh, I write there that uh, like um, a global war, a new world war in the next year is impossible. And I wrote this in, 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 in 2011, 2012. And of course, there was no world war in 2012. I, I was correct. But if I write it now, I would not be so sure. As I look at the rising tensions around the world, and most importantly, the rising tensions uh, between China and the United States, and the rising tensions in the South China Sea, now I'm not so sure. But as we look a few years to the future, a new global war is no longer as uh, unlikely as I thought it is 10 years ago. Let's write a chapter now together, and I'll tell you things that uh, had not happened when you originally wrote it. Uh, okay. Things that had not happened is CRISPR, the gene mm. editing technology that is going to change uh, um, medicine and, and, and biology. Going to change us. Yeah. It's going to change the human bodies. So CRISPR was not around when you, and so we will need a, a section about CRISPR. Mm. We will need a section about artificial intelligence, even yes. though it was uh, mentioned at the time, uh, 10 years ago, it did not have the primacy and the importance Absolutely uh, that not. it has today. Donald Trump was not there. And, I would uh, still keep him out. I mean, I don't <laughs> think that this is kind of a major historical event. Well, that unless, demands, he's uh, not a, unless he's not about him, Donald Trump, not as a Donald Trump, but as a symbol of the hmm. politics of the age. You, you have to acknowledge that, you know, may, you may not like him, uh, but, uh, but surely he symbolizes a kind of politics that is not just him. And the yeah, United that, States. that's it absolutely global, true. That as a global in nature. And then, and you did mention now China. Um, no, now it's commonly, it's common to talk about a new Cold War between the United States and China and the possibility of a armed Hot conflict uh, because yeah. of Taiwan or because of uh, escalating tensions between the United States and China can create. A, when you put all of these ingredients in this new chapter of the book, um, how, I, how do you think, give us the, the other side, which is the good news, the, the things news. that did happen that mm. uh, will help us navigate, prevent, contain the bad things that are already happening? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I, I think that we also see a lot of positive developments around the world continuing. Um, we see growing awareness of the problem of inequality, the problem of racism and misogyny and homophobia and so forth. And I think that this is a very positive development that even though there are regimes around the world that try to resist it, it's an extremely powerful historical force. And I think what is also really hopeful about it is that it was relative, I mean, this rising awareness of the equality of all humanity has created a tremendous revolution, largely in, in peaceful ways. If you think, for instance, about the feminist revolution and about the struggle for the greater equality for women, then over, even though we are still not, of, we are not in a completely equal society, the situation now is better than 10 years ago, is much, much better than 100 years ago. It's been one of the most successful and most important social revolutions in the history of humankind after thousands of years that people thought that women are inferior to men and they should have less political and economic power and so forth. It changed very rapidly. And most amazingly, it changed peacefully. The feminists did not need to start any violent revolutions or wars or build concentration camps or execute people or assassinate people. Some people think that to have a big revolution, you need violence. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So just look at the amazing achievements of the feminist revolution, which have been largely peaceful. So that's one uh, uh, very positive development. The other thing I would emphasize is that Thanks to the continued scientific and technological and economic development, we have enormous power. Our resources 
now are bigger than 10 years ago, are infinitely, are much bigger than a century or two ago. We have the power necessary to deal with all the threats we are facing. Uh, so it's not, it's not hopeless. If you think about climate change, yes, the ecological situation now is much worse than 10 years ago, but it's not too late. People sometimes jump from feeling that, no, this is not a real problem to feeling that it's hopeless, that it's too late. And it's not. If we invest just 2% of global GDP, annual global GDP, in developing new eco-friendly technology and infrastructure, this is enough to prevent catastrophic climate change. Just 2% of global GDP. It's a lot of money, of course, but it's completely feasible. It's a political decision. Politicians, this is their job, to change priorities and shift 2% of the budget from here to there. So this is why I'm still hopeful that we can deal with it. Except that Yuval uh, uh, Harari disagrees with you. Um, mm -hmm. A few years back, a British journalist asked, uh, was interviewing you. You perhaps remember that. Mm -hmm. And he asked you, tell us a secret. Mm. And you secret that you reveal something, he said. Tell us a secret. And, and what you said at the time is that the people who run the world don't understand it. Yes. <laughs> So reconcile that view hmm. with, uh, with what you just said. I think that, yeah, I mean, nobody really understands the world. Everybody understands that just their own kind of, of, of area. So business people understand business and politicians understand elections and how to do all kinds of deals and compromises to, to get power and so forth. Nobody has the broad picture. It's too complicated. It doesn't mean, however, that we can't do anything. If we do manage to convince the politicians that climate change is a number one priority, one of the chief priorities, they do have the knowledge, they do have the skills, how to make the deals and the compromises and then the th in order to shift 2% of our resources to, to the right place. Now, it's difficult, and I'm not, I can't tell you that I'm, I'm sure that they will do it. No, maybe they don't. Maybe they are blind. Maybe they don't see what's happening. Maybe they don't have the necessary wisdom to, 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 to arrange it. And, and, and then, yes, it's, it's a very tough future waiting for us and for the rest of the ecosystem. I don't think that there is any law of history or that there is any, anybody outside humanity which is watching us from above and making sure that everything will be okay in the end. No, we are on, a, on, on, on the verge of the precipice. We're on the verge of disaster. It totally depends on the decisions we make. We still have the power to make the right decisions, but it's not guaranteed. Maybe we don't make the right decisions or our leaders don't make the right decisions and the result is catastrophic. And there is a view uh, that says that the problem are not the politicians, but uh, the conditions on, in which they have to work and operate and the structure of incentives. Mm. And that the, the world and the countries have become largely ungovernable, uh, that they are uh, essentially now with identity politics in which uh, people associate with tribes and identities, mm. gender and race and uh, even geographical location. You belong to a club, yeah. you belong to a tribe. And that is more important than political parties, is more important than ideologies, more, you know, there's something else going on. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you need to operate in, again, talking about coordination. Yeah. This is coordination as a, at a lower scale uh, than mm -hmm. what that we need. And so it, politicians are doomed to fail because they don't have the answers that this new reality of a fragmented political system in which power is more ephemeral and more constrained and more limited, can, uh, they can operate. You, you, know, you, you cannot be successful as, as a politician, and as a government, as a president, prime minister. Mm. Do you buy that? No, I mean, I mean, of course, it's very difficult, and I, I, I'm sure I couldn't do it. I don't. I'm not a good politician. I'm not good in kind of building coalitions and making deals and all that, which is the the basic requirements of of a good politician. But 
I don't think that politics now is like more difficult than it was a century ago or 500 years ago. And I don't think it's, it's, it's bad that more groups have joined the political debate. What happened over the last uh, uh, few decades is that yes, there are more groups around the table. If you imagine politics as like you have a table and people sitting around it, and this is where they make the important decisions. For, so if you have five people around the table, it's a small group, they can make deals. Okay, you give me this, I'll give you that. Let's make a deal. It's, it's relatively simple. If you now allow dozens of more people to join in, you have now a hundred people around the table, it's much more difficult, yes, to, to reach an agreement, but it represents a broader uh, uh, selection of the interests and opinions of humans, and that's not necessarily bad. If 50 years ago, you have five white men sitting around the table ruling the world, and suddenly you say, okay, let's have some women also, and let's have, have some people of color, and let's have some gays, gay people there, and so forth. And it, it, yes, it becomes more complicated because suddenly these people have the interests and have opinions, but that's not bad. That's a more representative uh, uh, process of reaching decisions that will reflect not the interests of a very small segment of humanity, but of a bigger segment. And it's not that when you allow more people in, it creates an ungovernable situation. You need to change the, how the system works. Now, I'll give an exa historical example. The last time this thing happened was in the 1960s. But in the 1960s, if you look at a country like the United States, so you have the civil rights movements and you have the uh, uh, gender uh, uh, struggle of, of women and then of LGBT people, and it starts then. And you look what's happening and you see it, it seems like there is chaos, that you have political divides, you have rising political temperature, assassinations, riots, and so forth. And at the same time, you look at the Soviet Union and everything is completely peaceful. Nobody speaks against the government. There is no disagreement about anything. 20 years later, it's the Soviet Union that collapses, not the United States. The United States, through a difficult process, discovered how to include more people in the democratic system, how to balance more interests, more opinions, and the result was a better democracy, which works for the benefit of more people. The Soviet Union was frozen until it could no longer deal with the tensions and with the changing world and it collapsed. So I know the situation looks chaotic, but chaos is not always a bad thing. Out of chaos are born new things. In this conversation, we need to bring the internet and social media uh, hmm. as part of the story and what's happening. Because uh, in, in, the, in what you just described, uh, there was a, a lot of uh, uh, politicking. Uh, it's historically more or less the same, you know, build coalition and deal, do deals and try to govern with others and so on. But that has become far more complicated because of the role of social media. Hmm. You this this few weeks we have seen what has been labeled uh, the Facebook papers or the Facebook files mm -hmm. that explains uh, and shows uh, the, the immense impact, immense political impact uh, that the, the Facebook and others have had. So there is the story of uh, um, social media. So. Mm. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, th th there is a strong debate about what to do. Uh, should they be regulated? Should they be forced to divest and, and mm -hmm. change the, the, per the company? Leave it alone and, and trust that markets and technology will take care of it? Wh wh where do you stand in those debates? Well, I don't think that social media is a bad thing, but I certainly think that it should be regulated. It's not a bad thing because it's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, way for more people to communicate with each other. It's a way for more people to join the public conversation. And this is a good thing. It also released an immense amount of creativity. 
you know, 30, 40 years ago, people, let's say in the, in the media and in television, they thought about humans as couch potatoes. This was the basic paradigm. A human being is like a potato sitting on a couch, just passively watching content that somebody else, that the big media companies produce. Now it's amazing. Everybody, like the millions of, 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 of videos on YouTube or TikTok, who is producing them? We are producing them. Social media has released an immense flood of creativity among ordinary people, and that's a good thing. The problem is that the whole business model in social media is wrong. The business model is that everything is free, but still, of course, they have to make money somehow. So they make money from either advertisements or from collecting our data and selling it to somebody else to manipulate us, which is a terrible thing. And to do either of these things, they need to keep us on the platform longer and longer. So this is the big battle, how to capture people's attention and keep them on the platform. And I discovered that the easiest way to capture people's attention is to press the hate button, the fear button, the anger button in their minds. They show us things that make us more angry, more hateful, and this we can't resist seeing more and more of that. How do you and regulate that? How do you contain that? So we need regulations. First of all, that uh, when, when you look at, the, at, uh, at data and my data, it should be very clear that you cannot take my data and then use it to manipulate me or sell it to a third person. <laughs> there is a regulation against it in the Ten Commandments. It's thou shall not steal. It's my data. You cannot take it without my permission and use it against me. It's very simple. So this, this business model should be outlawed. And you know we have relationships that people take a lot of our data, know a lot about us, but don't use it to manipulate us. For instance, my relationship with, with my personal doctor, my doctor knows an awful lot of things about me, very private things, very important things. But it's, it's considered wrong for my doctor to take this personal data and sell it to somebody else so that they can manipulate me. In the same way, Facebook or, or, or Baidu or Google sh shouldn't be able to do it, very, very simple. My data should be used to help me, not manipulate me. The other uh, uh, principle that we should have is that you shouldn't allow the concentration of too much information in one place, to have an information monopoly. In the 21st century, information is the most important asset. It's, it's the basis for power, for political power. You know, thousands of years ago, it was land. Those who controlled the land controlled the kingdom or the empire. They were the aristocracy. Then in the last two centuries, land became less important. Machines, factories, mines, they became the key. And those who controlled the factories and the machines, they controlled the country. If all the factories were owned by a small group of oligarchs, what you got was oligarchy. If, on the other hand, you had, say, strong uh, workers' unions and the ownership of factories and mines and machines was more distributed, this was a safeguard for democracy. Now the key is not machines, it's not the factories, it's, it's the data. Those who control the data control the world we shouldn't allow all the data to be harvested and controlled by a small number, either of corporations or of governments. Because this can lead to a new form of digital dictatorships and to a new form of uh, data colonialism. You know, if all the data on the people in your country is being harvested and stored and analyzed by somebody in China or by somebody in the US, your country is no longer independent. If somebody there has the entire medical history, all the personal details of all your sexual encounters, all your likes and dislikes and everything you've done, they, you're no longer an independent country. So we need very clear regulations that prevents the over-concentration of data in one place and as for the business model that I mentioned earlier, 
it should, it should be dismantled. We can't have a business model that things are for free, but in effect, it's, uh, it's based on taking our data, brainwashing us, and selling our data to somebody else that tries to manipulate us. So probably the next important milestone in that space is the creation of policies or ideas uh, that will uh, allow the creativity and importance of uh, the social media to continue and, and increase, but at the same time protect uh, users. Yeah. Uh, consumer, you know, the digital consumers also need protection uh, from uh, both the consumers. Behavior. Yeah, consumers and also producers. I mean, right. uh, as we said, I mean, all these videos, which are the basis for the business of Facebook or TikTok, they didn't produce them. It's the users who produced them. So the users should get something out of it. And we just need to change the business model of this, of this entire ecosystem. And if we change the business model, I think it can be a very good thing. I mean, again, social media potentially is a wonderful thing, not a bad thing. We collected some questions from the audience uh, in preparation mm -hmm. for uh, this conversation. And I have one by, from Jorge Flores Salas, who asks, uh, what do you think could be the next big milestone for mankind that could be on par with the discovery of fire, the number zero, or writing? Mm. Well, we are already experiencing it right now, which is the rise of artificial intelligence. As you just mentioned, uh, 10 years ago when I wrote Sapiens, I didn't mention AI because, you know, it was something out of science fiction. The big AI revolution, the realization that AI is here and it's changing the world, it's only from the last five or six years. And we haven't seen anything yet. You know, you, almost every day you read about a new development in AI, being able to drive a car or diagnose a disease or, or, or write even write a, a poem. And it's just five or six years. We are nowhere near the full potential of AI. This is just the very first days of the AI revolution. It's likely that within 20 or 30 years, it will completely change the world. And the most important thing is, for the first time, there will be a tool that we created, but that can replace us in thinking and in making decisions. All the previous tools in human history, whether it's fire or whether it's the wheel or whether it's writing, they didn't replace the brain. Now this tool can replace us in making decisions, which means that for the first time, there is a very realistic option that power will shift away from humans to these new kind of tools. Combine that uh, with um, gene editing, um, you know, what are the, which is the most dangerous in your mind? Um, the, the technology and the science uh, involved in CRISPR, the editing of genes, mm -hmm. or the technologies going uh, um, underlying in, in, in artificial intelligence. Science and science innovation always have a very good thing that you just described, but also dangers, yes. right? So there are dangers to CRISPR gene mm -hmm. editing and there are dangers to artificial intelligence as you just described. Yeah. Which of the two you think is gonna hurt us first and more uh, significantly? Absolutely AI. AI is moving much, much faster than CRISPR. Biology is very complicated. Computers are much simpler. Uh, every generation of AI takes just a year or two to develop. But with CRISPR, you know, if you now do a, a genetic engineering experiment, even on a human baby, it will take 20, 30 years to really see the results of this experiment. And it takes time. Biological evolution, even if it's done, you know, by humans with CRISPR, it takes time. It takes a lot of time. So even if you now genetically engineer a baby, it will change the world in 30 years. In 30 years, there will be a completely different world because of AI. It's, uh, ultimately, I think that CRISPR is maybe a bigger thing, a deeper thing. It changes the code of humanity, but it's much more slow. So in terms of our lifetime, 
or of the next 30 or 40 years, yes, I would certainly pay attention to biotechnology also, but I would focus on the AI revolution simply because it is moving much, much faster. Your audiences everywhere, and including uh, this one, uh, are fascinated by your fascination with uh, meditation. And mm. there are many questions about that. There is one by Carmen Elisa Benavides Morales. She, she says, after raising such complex issues in uh, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, you end uh, with a chapter on meditation. Yeah. Do you believe that learning to know oneself through meditations helps to question, understand, and accept the changes the future brings? And you yourself have said that meditation enables you to see reality as it is. Hmm. And, don't, and it, it helps you not to get entangled in any story, in any fiction. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, first, I don't think that meditation is like the magic bullet that will solve all the problems of the world. It won't. Especially because I meditate myself, I know how difficult it is. So I have no illusion that in the next 20 years, billions of people will start to meditate and this will solve the, the problems of the world. It won't happen. It's too difficult. Um, I wrote it more on a personal level as some kind of introduction to the way that I think or that I approach these questions. And also, you know, the, the really important thing is the ability to know ourselves better because ultimately still it is we that control the world. It, it's not yet the computers or the AI, we are making the decisions. It's ultimately all about what's inside our own minds. You know, technology is a tool, you create a knife, you can use it to murder somebody, you can use it to save somebody's life in, in surgery. It's the mind that still decides what to do with the knife. And as we develop bigger and bigger knives, what's in our mind becomes more and more important. You mentioned CRISPR. What to do with it is, reflects the mythology, the philosophy, the poetry the, that we believe. So what is it that we believe, what's going on in our mind is now more important than in any previous time in history. And our mind is full of fictions. Our mind is full of delusions and illusions because the truth is often very complicated and very painful. People don't want to know the truth about themselves. They don't want to know the truth on a personal level. Like, I don't know, you, you, you're having difficult relationship in, in a family. So everybody would say, I'm fine. The problem is with the other people. It's very difficult for us to acknowledge that, no, I also did something wrong. Similarly, on, as a nation, uh, every nation is sure that it is perfect. It's doing, oh, it's doing well. Uh, it's the other nations that are at fault. It's very difficult. You know, if a politician, we, we talked earlier about politicians. If a politician in any country would go and tell people the truth, about their nation, this politician will never get elected. Not in Israel, not in Peru, not in the United States. It's too painful. Um, but if we don't acknowledge the truth about ourselves as, 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 as individuals or as nations or as the entire species, we won't be able to deal with the threats of the 21st century. We won't be able to make wise decisions. Um, so for me, meditation is one way to kind of train the mind to let go of these fictions, of these comforting illusions that we tell ourselves and be able to face the more painful reality. And, you know, I mean, the, the first time I went to meditation, it was 20 years ago, uh, I well, the first exercise we were given was extremely simple. Just watch the breath coming into the nostrils and going out of the nostrils. You don't try to control it in any way. You just observe what is happening. Just let, let things happen and, and feel going in and going out. And I was absolutely amazed that I couldn't do it for more than 10 seconds. I tried to just focus on my breath going in and out. And within 10 seconds, the mind runs away to some memory, to some fantasy, to some story. And it can take me two minutes or five minutes to remember, hey, I'm supposed to watch my breath. What am I doing? 
If I can't watch the breath in my mouth, in, in my nose, for 10 seconds without being dragged away by some illusion, by some fiction, what chance do I have of being able to understand climate change or the COVID crisis or global capitalism without being overwhelmed by the fictions that my mind and the minds of other people constantly produce? So maybe meditation, it, it doesn't necessarily work for all people. So for some people, therapy could work better, or maybe sports, or maybe art. Whatever works for you to train your mind, to be able to observe the truth about yourself, we should invest in it at least as much as we invest in AI or in CRISPR. There are great anxieties about the dehumanizing, all the, the technologies and the conditions and um, the, the, the life uh, that we live now that are, tend to be dehumanizing. Pilar Medina asks, uh, are feelings and emotions going to be muted by algorithms? Yeah. Are our future societies destined to live without feelings as their main drive? Can you describe an alternative world very different from what it is today? Um, as long as there are humans, there are feelings. This is really what defines us. The big difference between humans and AI is not intelligence. You know, AI is artificial intelligence. Intelligence, the ability to solve problems, whether in mathematics or chess or medicine, this is not unique to us. Computers can also do it. What is unique to us is that we have feelings and also other animals have feelings, computers don't. When a computer defeats you in chess, it doesn't feel happy. When a computer loses, it doesn't feel miserable. It has no feelings. Now, as computers become more and more powerful, I don't think it will uh, make human feelings disappear. The danger is that it will become easier and easier to manipulate humans by manipulating their feelings. This is what we see with social media, which we talked about earlier. Social media doesn't make the feelings disappear. No, it manipulates them. It's again, you have these big corporations and algorithms that press the hate button in your mind, that press the fear button in your mind. And this is how they manipulate you. And for instance, make you stay on the platform longer or vote for this politician or buy this product. What we should realize that is that humans can now be hacked. You know, the, the same way you can hack a smartphone or a bank, now you can hack the human being. We run our code is emotions, is feelings. For all of history, people wanted to hack humans, but it was too difficult. They did not have the technology, the, the knowledge to, to really understand what's happening inside us. Now it is becoming feasible. And that's very dangerous. It's dangerous not because it will make the feelings disappear, but because it makes us very vulnerable to being controlled and manipulated by big systems that understand what's happening inside us better than we understand it. And uh, we're running out of time, but I have one last question that it's, I think, quite significant. Mm. Uh, um, Maria del Rosario Bastidas asks, uh, Mr. Harari, although you are an atheist, mm -hmm. what is God to you? Who is God? Who is this God that the vast majority of humans believe in? Um, it's a story invented by people thousands of years ago that has immense importance in history that has done a lot of good as well as some bad things. But in the end, it, it's a story that humans invented. And, um, you know, even religious people would easily agree that all gods in history are human fictions, except for one, except for my God. I mean, it's very easy, for instance, for a Christian to say, yes, the gods of the Hindus, they are not real. They are just a story that the Hindus invented. And they ask the Hindus, they will say, yeah, our gods are real, but the gods of the Greeks or the gods of the Muslims, they are, they are a fictional story. So it's very easy actually, even for religious people to accept this idea. Now, even, and, and, and going a step further, 
even religious people would say, or at least some religious people, that everything that people say about God is their own invention. That God is really so far beyond the human capacity to understand that most of what people say about God, even if he's real, it's their projection. It's their invention. You know, people hate somebody. And instead of saying, I hate you, I hate these people, they say, no, it's not me. God hates them. God hates the Jews. Or God hates gays. Or God hates this and that. It doesn't, it, no, it's not true. It's not, God doesn't hate. It's people who hate. You know, if you think about, again, gay people. So even if there is a God, a good God, a good God would never punish people for love. A good God would punish people for violence, for hatred, for cruelty. But if two women love each other, why would any God punish them for love? So this idea that God hates it, this is a story invented by humans. If you want to get closer to God, it means giving up all these fictions that either your mind created or the mind of people in the past, a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago created, and trying to just observe reality as it is without trying to impose on it these illusions and fantasies that we created. If, um, together with the audience, I think we share um, the, the feeling that we don't want this conversation to end. It has been wide ranging, interesting, fascinating, surprising. And of course, there is much more to be said, but we run out of time. It is a pleasure and a privilege to have to been chatting with you. Uh, Yuval Noah Harari, one of the most influential thinkers of today. Thank you very much, Yuval, for being with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.